good. Good. So good afternoon, everyone. And welcome to Vanessa's uh, PhD Defense. My name is Amalia de Getzen, and I'm the moderator for this PhD Defense. On behalf of the Technical Faculty of IT and Design at Albu University, I would like to welcome all to this PhD Defense. Vanessa has submitted her uh, thesis as a part of the requirement for the PhD degree. The supervisor for this dissertation were Professor Dan Overholt, who's sitting over there, and Stefania Serafin. The thesis is entitled Designing for Meaningfulness in Future Smart Products. And the thesis is based on at least 10 scientific studies, a literature review in relation to his own work, and all the meaningful conversation, dialogues, and activities Vanessa has carried out within industry and academia. The dean has appointed an adjudication committee to evaluate the work of Vanessa. There are two external members and one representative from Olbo University, who is also the chairman of this uh, committee. It is a pleasure that two international recognized scientists have accepted to be part of this committee. On behalf of the faculty, I would like to welcome Associate Professor Laura Watts from uh, the Institute of uh, Geography, School of Geoscience, University of Edinburgh, Scotland, and uh, Associate Professor Jamie Allen, Canada researcher in infrastructure, media, and communication, Halifax, Canada. As chairman of the committee, the faculty has appointed associate professor Olga Kinchenko. Um, the program for today is divided in two sections. So first, the PhD candidate will give our PhD lecture for a maximum of uh, 45 minutes. Then we will have a short break before the committee will raise questions and comments to the PhD candidate. When the committee has no further questions, the audience will also have a chance to ask questions or give comments on my direction. So if you have questions to the PhD candidate, please approach me during the break. This session will uh, end no later than uh, 3 p.m. and after that there will be a reception. So please, Vanessa, you're welcome to uh, give your PhD. Lecture. Thank you. <coughs> so thank you all for coming. Um, especially all the way up to Hersholm. Uh, I will jump right into things and explain a little bit about where we are and everything as we get started. But thank you so much for being here, and especially you guys. Thanks. So I wanted to start with a little story. Um, some of you know this product, some of you don't. This is Fibo. It's a pregnancy wearable for partners of pregnant um, women. And basically the woman wears a patch and the partner can feel on their wrist the movements of the baby throughout the day. And this, for me, is a very good example of designing for meaningfulness because it speaks to several different qualities. It speaks to the connection of the father to the baby. He can feel the baby's movements throughout the day. It speaks to the father and mother connecting more throughout the pregnancy. It's very much about the tangibility, about actually feeling the movements of this baby, right? And it's about the stories that emerge from this. So maybe the father comes home and he says, wow, the baby's been kicking all day long. What's been going on? The mother says, well, I had some curry for lunch, and I guess he got excited, right? Or maybe it's about the stories that the father tells to his co-workers. And all of this is about identity. So as the partner becomes more and more of a parent and learns more and more about themselves, who have I been? Who will I be? Who do I want to be as a parent? For me, this is very much about designing for meaningfulness. So with this in mind, the agenda for today, um, you guys should maybe have a folder, um, which you will get along the way. And it will have everything in it, including an errata, which has some little mistakes. Um, we are at FORCE, and I'm coming from Marlborough University, so I'll explain that. I'm going to jump into interaction design, give a brief definition of meaningfulness, talk a little bit about the background of where meaningfulness evolved from, jump into the methodology, explain the seven engagements and nine publications, and talk about my work within industry and the limits and conclusions. And I will do all of this in 40 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so first of all, at Force Technology, I'm a lead specialist in technology experience design where I have been for the past seven years. During the period of this PhD, I've been managing a project called Design Smart Things, which is a performance contract, and I've also been managing two other projects, which are called Designing for Meaningfulness and FIBO. At Albor University, I'm a PhD candidate at the Doctoral School of Engineering and Science, and this is a very long title, so I'm going to skip it, but that's where I am. So in my work, I've been working within interaction design. And some of you may be familiar with this and some of you not, so I'm going to just briefly, briefly introduce it. So interaction design is very much about understanding people 
and technology, right? And it's about designing technology for people. For some people, this means making websites, and some interactions do, designers do that, and you might be familiar with that term in that sense. But for me, it's about working with hardware. And I really like this diagram by Bill Verplank, and he asks, how do we do, how do we feel, and how do we know? So how do we do things, right, with these products? And how do they make us feel, and how do they inform us of different things? So to give you a practical example, if you are in my age range or higher, you might remember the Palm Pilot. And the Palm Pilot um, was invented by a guy called Jeff Hawkins. And what he did was he carried a little piece of wood around with him. So it was about mobile phone size before we all carried smartphones around. And he t pretended to take notes on it. So he'd meet people and make calendar appointments or look up phone numbers or look up dates or whatever else. And through this, he eventually began to design the technology and experience of using a PDA, right? So if we look at the academic description of interaction design, a more recent one, Logren, Larson, and Holbein present five aspects of interaction design. Artifacts acting as catalysts for transformation, which are curious in nature, and therefore explore possible futures, thus framing design situations and proposals which are represented and explored by a tangible sketching, enabling thinking through making, and consider a range of qualities, including instrumental, technical, aesthetic, and ethical, all in one breath. So, um, if we think about the Palm Pilot, this is very much an artifact which is a catalyst for transformation. Right? It's something you're carrying around and you're changing the way you interact with people. You're changing the way you get to information. It's curious in nature. It's, it's literally a block of wood that you're pretending to write on. Right? That's very curious. <laughs> and it's exploring possible futures and design solutions to find out how are we going to use this new technology. And it's doing something called tangible sketching. We're trying things out. Right? We're, we're building something and trying things out and thus enabling thinking through making and considering a range of qualities whilst doing so. So, in my PhD, first and foremost, I have been situated in industry, also where we're sitting today. So industry has been a context. I have looked into different theoretical works, and I've also looked into some past projects. And through that, I've created seven engagements. I've done research with companies. I've created something called the Mechanics of Meaningfulness and the Manifestations of Meaningfulness. And I've compared and contrasted these in what's called annotated portfolios. And the timeline of this, just to give you a little bit of background, has been back in 2002, I did a Bachelor of Science in Interactive Art and Technology. And in 2007, I, did a, I started a Master's in Interaction Design in Sweden, and I joined a collaborative interactive arts studio called Illutron. In 2010, I started my own company called Geek Physical, and I also started something called Grotesque Burlesque, or joined it at that point. 2012, I joined Idemo Lab, and from 2016 to 19, I've been working on this PhD and Idemo Lab. So with that timeline in mind, I wanted to show you a little bit of my past projects. And that's very much because the lesson of this is we can do anything with technology, right? At Illutron, we played with a large one-ton industrial robot, getting it to play with people and giving it a personality. We made a playground at Roskilde Festival where you could drum and you would get fire. We switched the bathroom signs at a nightclub so that we could explore communication and break down social barriers. At Geek Physical, we made a corset, which gets tighter when your heart rate goes up. We made some walking sticks, which would explore a community and tell the tale of that community and the amazing energy that was present there. We made the touching booth, where two people would touch and they would get a photo taken, thus breaking down social physical barriers. And at Idemo Lab, we've made a variety of intelligent pill boxes, helping people to remember to take their medication. We've created a lamp, which is also a speaker, which explores companionship and technology. And we've created a pen to help diabetics remember the last time they took insulin. So all of these show us that technology is not just necessarily the apps on our phones or something that bleak, beeps or blinks. Dana Sullivan and Tom Ego have showed us that tech physical computing could be this. This is how computers see us, right? There's keyboards, so we have fingers. There's a screen, so we have eyeballs. And there's speakers, so we have ears. And maybe now we also have fingerprints because of our phones and face prints, but this, th this is it. That's us, right? And this is from 2004. It's very old, but it really puts into perspective the amazing things we can do with technology versus what we interact with. And then we get smart things, right? So I really like this quote here. A chip-centric mentality has taken over, one that is guided by an overly simplistic principle. Internet connectivity makes Good objects, great. And then we get things like smart water bottles and smart clothespins and smart hairbrushes 
and smart wine bottles and smart socks that tell you where the left and right one is and how many times they've been washed. And we start to get this gadget fatigue, right? And I really love this quote by Light, Powell, and Shavlovsky who say, currently technology is more about enhancement and less about eudaimonia, the good life. So what I want to, or what I do know, is that the possibilities with technology are endless. What I want to know is how we can use it to help ourselves become better humans. And therefore I'm asking the question, how do we design for meaningfulness in our lives? So, on to meaningfulness, finally, right? In less than 230 pages, it is, my framing is that eudaimonia is about fulfillment in life, and this is very much what I put meaningfulness into. It's about leading a meaningful life. It is not what I mean by something, and it is not something that we need in our lives. A toilet is very meaningful. If we did not have a toilet, we would be pretty upset. It's meaningful, but it's not meaningful in the way that I mean. It's getting fun, right? It gets more fun. Huta did a statistical psychological study a little while ago and gave us four ways of looking at meaning. Meaning is orientation, uh, caring about the big picture, seeking ways to make a contribution, meaning as a behavior, doing volunteer work and donating blood, meaning as experience, feeling that an activity of yours was valuable and important, and meaning as functioning, achieving a realistic conceptual framework for making sense of life events. And this is very interesting, and I, I thought a lot about this, and for me, two of these were really relevant for what I was looking at in terms of meaningfulness. This is meaning as orientation, looking at the big picture, and meaning as experience, that an activity of yours is valuable and important. And then I framed it in my head into three different things. People to people connections, a person to their sense of self, and people to time. So if we think about FIBO again, people to people is the father to the mother, the father to the child, the father to society. People to sense of self is the father to his own sense of parenthood. Who am I? What kind of parent will I be? And people to time is very much about this whole idea of like, who have I been? Who will I be? What is happening right now? How is my mind changing about things on a daily basis? And this has many, many different combinations. So why do we care about meaningfulness in technology? Besides just the gadget fatigue that I mentioned before, interaction design literature points to this as an important ambition and a direction with technology. And we are living in a digital age. So technology pervades our lives. And I wonder if it should only be about convenience. So I started looking at literature. And basically, I looked into physical computing, tangible interaction, experience design, everyday objects, presence, well-being, happiness, authenticity, positive design, hedonic qualities, eudaimonia, and reflection. Many, many, many areas. <laughs> Trying to find out who is talking about meaningfulness. And I will just say, Amalia, that I forgot to start the timer, so let me know. <laughs> um, and in my dissertation, this is presented as a lot of text, comparing and contrasting all of these qualities, comparing them to my own work. But for your sake today, you get a diagram. So here we have the more physical qualities, physical computing, tangible interaction, everyday objects, experience design, and who's spoken about those. We have over here well-being, authenticity, positive design, happiness, hedonic qualities, eudaimonia, and reflection. And then we have meaningfulness. A lot of people mention the word meaningfulness. Some mention meaning making and some talk about meaning, right? So this is all over the place. There's really a lot of literature that's sort of getting into all these nooks and crannies of meaningfulness. And when I wrote the papers that I wrote, um, I looked into even more areas, right? I looked into things like mindfulness and digital fabrication and IoT and identity and gender and DIY and jewelry design, and obsolescence and heirloom objects and presence and bodily engagement and music platforms and embedded systems. So my literature ex was really, really extensive. And therefore I found this gap, this explicit definition of meaningfulness, right? And so I wanted to ask, could the following be catalysts for meaningfulness? So I have a small dis dissertation. I have a small dissertation. No, I don't I have a big dissertation. <laughs> I have a small disclaimer that the dissertation explores each of these in depth. Each relates to theory and empirically driven works. The mechanics, manifestations, and types of connections are my starting point, and they begin framing these catalysts for meaningfulness. They can be generative or evaluative and are fundamentally considerations for practitioners. And fundamentally, people create their own meaningfulness. I cannot make meaningful products. I can only design for meaningfulness. So here are the mechanics of meaningfulness. 
First of all, we have personal development. Who am I? Who have I been? Who might I be? Moments of significance, this aha moment when you transform. Something about value over function. What the thing does is not that important. What value it leads to in your life is quite important. We have meaning in everyday life. Meaning is different for me and for you and from right now to five minutes from now. And critical thinking, asking the hard questions, right? And then through my work, this idea of offline artifacts emerged. What about things that are offline, right? We're making so much IoT smart stuff. What about stuff that's just offline? Then we have the manifestations. These are non-screen, right? These are considerations for product designers, right, for practitioners. They could be non-screen. What if it's tangible? What if you work with a traditional craftsman to make it? What if it's an everyday object? And again, the types of connections, people to people, person to sense of self, and people to time. So throughout all of this, I followed a methodology. This is a diagram adapted from Logan, Larson, and Hobai, where I take my past projects and all the different literature and everything else that I've read, and this forms my optics of how I see things, right? And then I make these seven engagements, and I read all this other literature, and it also affects my optics. And throughout all of this, I come up with three takeaways, which I will present to you. And all of this points to some future work, right? And research through design. Uh, there's a lot of people who talk about this. I like this description by Bill Graver. He says, it's exploring a wide space of potential designs, whether through sketching scenarios, narratives, or narratives, <laughs> or design proposals. And that the practice of making is a route to discovery. If you remember the Palm Pilot, that's what that was about. And that design and research through design is generative. Rather than making statements about what is, design is concerned with what might be. So for me, my interaction, or my research through design process has been in an interaction design framework. It's been about sketching and hardware, building these seven early prototypes that I call engagements. I've explored different domains. I've elicited knowledge. I've identified the gap in the landscape of academic research, which has elicited more knowledge, and hopefully my knowledge has contributed back to that landscape. And I've explored what might be an in industry. So, okay, you're counting down. I thought that was the actual time. We're good. All right. <laughs> I was like, damn, I have five minutes left. All right. <laughs> so I will slowly explain my research questions now that I have so much time left. <laughs> I have two research questions. First of all, how might we conceptualize designing for meaningfulness within interaction design to benefit industry who are developing consumer-facing smart products? The second one, what might be the manifestations, the physical characteristics, of meaningfulness of a smart product which acts as a catalyst for personal meaningfulness? Okay, that's a mouthful, but we'll get through it. So I wanted to introduce you to the gallery of engagements um, that I've made. You can go around and read all the descriptions and play with them later on. So this is going to be a very brief introduction. Um, but basically, each engagement exists to explore, evaluate, and sometimes demonstrate aspects of meaningfulness, either value-based, the metrics, or physical-based, the manifestations, and sometimes both. And each engagement also relates to the types of connections, people to people, people to sense of self, and people to time. So we've already heard about FIBO. You guys know that one, right? This resulted in two publications, one at Nord Design and one at Designing Interactive Systems. Electronic Kintsugi. Kintsugi is the traditional Japanese craft of repairing ceramics with precious metals. So we worked with a Kintsugi artist in Japan to make some bowls where you could touch them and they will make different sounds. Right? And this was a on-purpose unfinished product. Right? It was very much about what can we do to enable people to explore different scenarios and explore what meaningfulness is to themselves. And that was through a lot of different ways. Right? One of the great examples that we heard was a guy was with his father-in-law waiting for his girlfriend to get dressed so they could go to dinner. And the father-in-law only spoke Danish and he's from Great Britain, so he only spoke English. And then they were sitting there stuck, right? Because they don't have a common language. But they had the electronic kintsugi, so they played with it together. And then they created this like experience together. So that was a moment of potential meaningfulness, fostering relationships with other people. And this resulted in a paper at the Future Technologies Conference. Trike Weil, which hopefully I've said correct because I've had training from everyone and it's still not working, um, is an offline, non-connected object. 
the whole idea with it, it's moving over here if you want to look at it while I'm speaking, is that it is trying to help you to take a moment in the day and do some bodily reflection and breathe. So if we all just right now take a deep breath in and out, and at least I'm a little bit calmer, we all have a little bit more oxygen in our brains, and we've done that, you know, we can follow this device and it's not tracking us, it's not online, it's not giving statistics, it's just a dumb product, right? So I wanted to explore what, what about dumb products? And this resulted in two papers, one at Thai and one at the Persuasive Technology Conference. MuscleMinder was a project that I did with Simon Fraser University's Haptics Lab. And this was very much about exploring mindfulness and body connection and tangibility. So we built this thing. We learned that when you are doing exercise, if you focus on your muscle, then you will recruit more muscle fibers. So basically, we built this thing which squeezes your muscle before you do an exercise. And then in, it measures your muscle activity and gives you some feedback, right? Um, so again, this is a non-screen approach. It's something about mind-body connection, and it's over there. Music Fabrique was um, an exploration of a new everyday object. Many of us have Bluetooth speakers in our homes today. And so for me, this was, what about this new everyday object that we have? Right? And it's right here. You guys can check it out later on. And what we did was we worked with Libertone, who have this removable speaker cover, to create a playable speaker. So you could imagine coming home from work, picking up the speaker, making some music, developing yourself as a musician, as a creative person, that sort of thing. This resulted in two papers, one at Nordicai and one at the Sound and Music Computing Conference. Tiba is a wearable for changing eating habits. This is a company that is um, originally developing something for people with, who have recently been diagnosed with diabetes, and they are trying to figure out how do I get rid of these bad habits, right? So if you come home and you feel you know, hungry, is it actually hunger or is it because you're tired, right? So then what we made for them is over there, and you would basically press it and then turn the dial to how much hunger you're feeling. This information would go to a nutritionalist and then they would help you like analyze these bad habits that you have and create new habits in their place. And Future Pleasure Objects is an ongoing research project with artists, hackers, feminist hacker spaces, and basically this is about exploring pleasure. This is not necessarily sexual pleasure, this can be non-sexual pleasure. And it's very much about how can technology enable us to explore both technology but also ourselves and our ideas of what pleasure is. So this resulted in a paper at the Politics of the Machine Conference, and you can see one of our kits, because it was very much about building DIY kits, right over there. And you did not count incorrectly. The final publication comes up in the next part. So, industry. As I work here at Force Technology, I am in industry, often. And I work with a lot of different companies, and for everyone in this room that I've worked with, thank you so much for being part of this. I've done some workshops, I've done some seminars, I've done in-depth interviews with Danish design companies, and I've done some workshops with Welfare Technology. And the workshops with Welfare Technology got us to thinking about the metrics of meaningfulness. So we tried to use some different worksheets, both from psychology studies, also from someone who's doing a postdoc in meaningfulness, and also someone working in industry who's been talking about meaningfulness. And basically we identified these four different metrics as starting points for how we could start to measure meaningfulness in our products. Meaningfulness in the everyday, the one that I already spoke about, that aha moment. Value over function. Purpose, what are my personal goals in life? And significance, something more than momentary interaction. And so these four here are just the starting point for what could be a way for companies to evaluate themselves, not in terms of how meaningful is my product, but have I thought about meaningfulness when designing this product? And this resulted in a publication which we're presenting at Kai in May. And out of this, we also created some tools for industry, which you guys will take home with you today, which is a booklet containing some guidelines and also all the different um, aspects of metrics and manifestations and mechanics. So what is the relevancy of this? In academia, it's about us identifying this gap, this meaningfulness gap, and creating this map of related research. So like looking through all the different literature and pulling out all these points, those different things that I showed you. I've created these characteristics, the mechanics, the manifestations, and the metrics, and I've been pointing towards future research. 
and future research is already here. Future research just won the best paper award at CHI. And that is um, Eliza Meckler and Caspar Hornbeck who created a framework for the experience of meaning in human computer interaction. So my work is already contributing to future work that's already happening. And Alter University is having a program for where they're hiring both professors and PhD students looking into meaningfulness. So this is very relevant in academia. And because I work in industry, I'm very concerned about the bridge to industry. So I've been doing talks and seminars and trying to do cross collaboration and invite researchers into industry. And industry has responded pretty well. They've said things like, it was a great pleasure and I look forward to hear what the future brings when meaningful design is a part of product development. In industry, we've received 650,000 kroner for the Designing for Meaningfulness project. That's the largest awarded to a GTS agency. We've spent money on this PhD and that is also supported by industry. I've been invited to do talks around the world about designing for meaningfulness and that also shows that industry is interested in this. So, one more deep breath, in, out, yeah, it's good, right? I have three takeaways for you. These are presented in the dissertation as annotated portfolios. And this is a way to compare and contrast three of my engagements or past projects with one external project. And basically I'm trying to ask if the smart product you are creating considers these things. I'm also asking if the smart product you are creating considers the manifestations and the mechanics. But for now, these are the three takeaways. The first one is people to people. So does your product help develop relationships between people? Does it help deepen those relationships? And does it help create shared identity? It doesn't have to do any of these things. It doesn't have to do all of these things. It's just things to think about, right? Then we have people to a sense of self. So does your product facilitate self-expression, self-development, or self-exploration? With people to time, does it consider the short versus the long term? When we're talking about short and long term, we might be talking about hedonic versus eudaimonic. So like instantaneous pleasure versus like long lasting fulfillment. Does it consider a sense of time, right? With Feeble, there's very much a sense of time. This baby is growing and it's kicking harder and I'm becoming a parent very, very soon, right? And is there a representation of time in the product? Does it just tell you your steps today or does it tell you your steps over a long time and give you some idea of how you've been improving? Throughout all of this, there has been a red thread. It kept coming up in all the literature, it kept coming up in my own research, it kept coming up in the ways that I was thinking about things. And this is self-reliance. So I think this is another valuable thing to consider when we are designing for meaningfulness in future smart products. There have been some limitations. <laughs> and the limitations are very much that I have been focusing on consumer-facing smart products. I have not been looking at industrial IoT, I have not been looking at all sorts of different applications. I've narrowly set myself in consumer-facing smart products. And this is a research through design process. If I had done a long-term deployment, I would have taken one of these and done it for three years. But the beauty in research through design is that I can take seven of these and compare and contrast and learn and gather all this knowledge and feed knowledge back and get knowledge again. And yeah, it's good. The term meaningfulness means that one has to derive their own meaning from the term and explore how it is meaningful in their lives. Do you see the problem? It's a horrible word. <laughs> but it is a word that everyone responds really, really well to. If I say designing for meaningfulness, they immediately know what I mean, right? Then again, when we've been talking to companies, sometimes we ask, how meaningful is your product? And they say, out of 10, it's 10, right? Um, they say, of course our product is meaningful. But if we talk to them a little bit more, we get into the nuances of personal development and everyday interaction and all these things that I mentioned that I can't remember right now, they say, our product is not meaningful, not in the way that you mean, like the toilet, right? The toilet might be a 10 out of 10 in meaningfulness. Without a toilet, we'd be really sad, but it's a zero out of 10 in personal life fulfillment. I really, really like this quote. How to design for the common good, focusing on human needs for meaning, fulfillment, dignity, and decency, qualities which technology struggles to support but can easily undermine, right? This is that whole gadget fatigue thing again. And this is what I'm really, really interested in getting into. I wanna be focusing and I want us as practitioners to focus on people, to focus on experience, to focus on self-reliance. Through doing so, have enough old school 
to raise others up and therefore hopefully experience some meaningfulness. So in summary, I have created the mechanics of meaningfulness, the manifestations of meaningfulness. I've pointed towards some metrics for meaningfulness. I've presented the three takeaways and I've done a mapping of literature. I see this work as a first step in moving towards an area of research called designing for meaningfulness. I've done this within interaction design by creating seven engagements and it's happened within industry. My hope is that by focusing on designing for meaningfulness, we ask ourselves if the consumer facing smart product we are creating is really truly needed in this world and if it contributes to a world where people become more empathic, making life better not only for themselves but importantly helping others to achieve meaningfulness in their lives as well. And this has been a collaborative effort so thank you to everyone and also the people who have not made it up on this because I have no more brain at this point in the PhD. <laughs> yes, thank you so much. It's a very unusual location for uh, a defense of a PhD. Um, so I'm also very grateful to be uh, to, to the Arsene Force to be here. Um, but um, like I said, it is unusual because normally when we do a PhD defense, um, it's in uh, it's an academic university setting uh, with kind of our academic colleagues, or uh, as well as kind of you know family and friends as well of a PhD uh, candidates. So being here at the at, at the company where you're based, I think um, you know we suddenly felt want to make that explicit as a slightly different setting. Mm -hmm. So also to say to the audience that here, the kinds of questions we want to get into were you know we want to talk about. Um, some of the things that might not normally talked about in an industry setting, but we have also be mindful of where we are. But there's an agency to being in this room. There is. Um, there's an, and so I just want to be explicit to say about that. So there's going to be sort of senses of resistances and movements. And, you know, so that, I think it's important to say that because we don't want to explicitly um, create, you know, uh, discomfort in, a, in, a, in, a, in an unpleasant sense. But I think there's things that are really important in your thesis that we'd like to draw out sure. to the politics. So we just want to flag that up for everybody in the audience to recognize about you know, where we are and the kind of work we're going to be doing here uh, in this room. Um, but I think uh, well, actually, I think it's really important also for your thesis because you've been working in industry context. Um, is there anything you want to add to that? I mean, I think we'll ask you to talk about that mm -hmm. because it's a very interesting set of stakeholders that you've brought up. And so one of them is very present here today because we're in its building. <laughs> and, you know, they're also the people that just say sponsor the work. And so this is interesting vis-a-vis -vis the way that academic practice is changing mm -hmm. around us. And some of us have resistance to that a little bit. And some of us are really on board for it. And so, you know, there's a lot of spectrums of what it means to do an industry PhD, which is not a technical stipulation in your PhD. It's just something that you've mm. done by context. Like yep. this, right? Um, it's also a really big question vis-a-vis -vis what it means to do a practice-based PhD, which you also have a technical stipulation around, but you've done by context. And so like these things are almost definitional, this is why you're introducing it very well, Laura, is that we do have to kind of look at what the PhD is mm -hmm. and what you <coughs> think it is yeah. and, and whether or not therefore it is a success. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we we'll probably start with that kind of question. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think if you want to kick off with that, we'll start there. You're in, mm -hmm. you want to um, so yeah, I mean, fundamentally, we just you know, segue. Um, sure. It's interesting to think about uh, how uh, uh, PhDs have changed, and so uh, in, in the current moment, we have a lot of kind of interest in how you can be uh, pr pragmatically linked to the real world. Uh, you know, it's a doctor of philosophy, right? And so this is the whole history of it. Uh, has to do with, in a way, getting away from the real world, uh, or actually reflecting on it. And so what you've done is is a hybridization of like you know, a very large number of communities who you're obviously very grateful to and care for, which is to be applauded in every way because it's, it's, it's getting us away from a model of kind of egocentric, you know, uh, uh, sort of extemporization and stuff like that. Um, but at the same time, there must have been, and I think what Laura was opening up with addresses a certain number of potential tensions or, or, or gaps or openings that might have been problematic because would be all these stakeholders industry, you have the communities of DIY uh, production, you did all this stuff, then you have the audiences and then, then you have academia, which is another whole list, like HCI, interaction design, uh, design research, you know, and all 
audience. So I think, I think it would be just good to hear you talk a little bit about who you conceive of as the audience, mm -hmm. and this feedback that you that you obviously felt to be really important, but to be generous and give back to these communities sure. from the Chevron. So who those people are, and I guess both problems and affordances of the ways in which that feedback can take place or, or can't take place. So, mm -hmm. Does that question make sense? I think so. So I would say that the audience, um, it has been a very interesting balancing board, right? Um, and from very early on, I tried to place myself with one foot in academia, with my weight on that foot, balancing the other foot in industry. Because I am in context in industry, so that was very difficult to be here. But it was more of a challenge, in a good way, to be in academia. And so basically, I've tried to very much make part of, and that's also why my dissertation is so long. I've seen a lot shorter <laughs> dissertations when they're PhD by publication, but I wanted it to be longer to give something back to the academic community to say, this is, this is the landscape that I've mapped out, right? This is what I've been trying to explore. This is the annotated portfolios that compare and contrast these projects so that we can elicit different things from them. And when I've been doing that, I've also been trying to work with different co-authors within academia, which has been extremely a beautiful process because it's really been like, they draw me into their world and then I learn about their ways of doing it. I was able to go to the other AAU up in Albor, mm -hmm. <laughs> and they have a whole interaction design department up there. So I got to know all of those guys. And so that's been very, very nice is meeting that audience, both in Denmark and outside of Denmark, and both conversing with them and giving them you know, the research that I've been doing and getting them to comment on that and, and having that discourse. Um, on the other hand, in industry, as I've explained, I've done a lot of different dissemination. And that's been, it's been very nice because it's been on demand. People hear that I'm doing Designing for Meaningfulness and they're excited. And that's been really, really nice to have that. And it also provides opportunity to work with companies and then I get that real world aspect. So part of my audience is definitely the industry practitioners who hopefully can benefit from the tools that we've started to create, but the knowledge that we've gathered in academia. And I think that's one of the main things that I'm interested in, is taking all that stuff that's happening in academia and bringing it over to industry and letting them explore it and then bringing it back to academia and saying, hey, look what happened, right? Um, because that's something in my seven years at IDEMO Lab I have not experienced elsewise, right? I haven't seen that happen. It's, it's more of a kind of pragmatic. It's very pragmatic, yeah, and we, we don't have time to go into databases and look up articles and do all this kind of stuff. It took me a very long time to get into all the different articles because I had to relearn this language from my masters of six years ago, right? Um, and that's something in my day-to-day -day job I never had time to do. I made a small follow-up because it does lead into something that, that I was thinking earlier. Like, um, it seems like you're positioning the work in a particular way reaction to something. Mm -hmm. And I want to know what that is. So it's because you just mentioned all this interest, right? Like mm -hmm. What do you think is driving this interest? Um, I mean, you, you could say that the temporalities of academia and industry are different, and this is what you just addressed. And you, you talk about slow design that you're writing, mm -hmm. which is, I guess, a kind of you know, link to you know, slow movements and, yes. and, 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 and kind of pensiveness and, and be thoughtful about things that you do. But there, it seems to me that. You're, you're, you're reacting to something. Meaningfulness is a reaction to something. Sure. That I would love to hear you characterize as emphatically and provocatively as possible. <laughs> sure. I'm tired of bad gadgets. <laughs> That's my provocative <laughs> statement. Um, my, my other side of the statement is that in the research I've done in academia, the people that I've met in academia, there's more and more and more and more writing coming out, especially at conferences like Thai and Dis and Kai, where everybody's starting to write about things that are not the IoT or challenging the IoT or what is this IoT or, you know, IoT revolution and all this stuff about like, why are we so obsessed with the IoT? And then in, in industry, I see the same thing. IoT is, is such a hideous buzzword, <laughs> right? Um, and it's something that, is very, very powerful because it is what businesses are doing, right? They are very excited to get on board IoT. You know, McKinsey promises us 11 
billion dollars in IoT, and every startup thinks they're getting that 11 billion dollars, right? Um, and that results in everybody trying to put chips in things, right? And then there's a backlash from academia who says, oh, but have you thought about this and that and the other thing? And then industry doesn't necessarily hear it. But at the same time, they're trying to be critical. You know, like, for instance, Force Technology has this Nordic IoT Center, and they've actually tried to think about and engage with um, Irina's virtue ethics program, right? So they're trying to get into these things, right? But it's very difficult to navigate and to connect the two. So for me, it's, it's very much starting with my industry perspective of just seeing more and more and more companies wanting more and more smart products. And then from the industry perspective, or from the academic perspective, of seeing more and more works about what is this and why are we doing this and what are these products that are coming out and what do they mean in terms of who we are becoming, right? Uh, yeah, so we're going to, as you can tell, do something of a double act. Um, yes, so uh, I like it. <laughs> I'm really interested in this, when you're talking about, um, there's two things. One is, um, I want to push you a little bit when you're saying about kind of industry versus academia, because that's mm. certainly not been your experience. Mm. And um, I think that, and that's not what I certainly read in your thesis, is I think, you know, they're, um, they're not ratified in any kind of separate way, and haven't been for some time. But I was wondering to say two things. One, if you could say who... In, in academia, um, are, you know, kind of like the allies you're working with and the particular kind of fields of research, that kind of locating it, and also who in industry? Because, you know, by gosh, even within a company, as I'm not sure, actually, you know, uh, I should also say the audience, I've, you know, both of us have a lot of experience working mm. collaborating either indirectly or collaborating with different companies. Yeah. So it's very diverse. So if you could also tease apart for me the kind of like the who uh, in academia and the who in sure. industry you're, yeah. you're, you're, you're really trying to talk with. Yes. Um, so, I think if I understand, I just want to make sure I understand your question correctly. So, the who in academia, these are people who are speaking about similar things that I'm excited to be. Is that what you're meaning? Or yeah, you? so I'm talking about other people or fields of research yes. uh, as specifically as you kind of can. That sure. People make you excited to go, yeah, this, I'm part of this, these people over here. These, these guys, people, they've got it going on. Yeah. But, you know, <laughs> the people you're in conversation with, you, yeah. you feel a, a sort of a collaborative uh, yes. place of working with. Yeah. Um, I mean, first, it's, it's very easy to say um, Eliza Meckler and, and Casper Hornbeck because I've been writing with Eliza. Um, and that's been very interesting because Casper um, Hornbeck comes from uh, Copenhagen University in a traditional sort of IT area, but he's also exploring meaningfulness. And then Eliza is coming from the University of Basel, and she's coming from a background in game design and psychology, but she's also into this, right? So suddenly, these people are excited about this, and I'm trying to be curious about, or not I'm trying to, I am curious about what are they excited about. And then those conversations have been very, very interesting. And then those are sort of a couple of examples, but if you look into bigger domains, I guess you could say, um, as I mapped out in the literature, there's a lot of areas like positive design. Positive design covers many of the things that I've spoken about in terms of meaningfulness. Right? There's a positive design institute, and the woman running it is, is just doing some amazing work there. Um, and they are looking at things like virtue and things like, oh, I just read this earlier, now I can't even remember, behavior change and all sorts of stuff that is, is very, very relevant. Um, and I think in the center, they put eudaimonia. Right? So they say, okay, if you do all of these things, you might get some fulfillment in life. Right? And I think they're doing really fascinating work, and I think they've really pegged quite a few things. And also Zimmerman, he's been talking about designing for the self, and that was a while ago, I think that was in 2009 or something like that. So how do we make objects that we care about, which then help us exploring our identities? So there's many people who are talking about different facets of this, um, and I think those are really, really interesting to get into. Mm -hmm. You have a Thing. No, you yes, Laura. Yeah, sorry. You look like so you're I, uh, I just wanted to, because um, I know you're going to pick up on that. No, music, yeah. But the, uh, so, it's, um, so you're talking about these particular, uh, you know, different groups of people in, mm -hmm. in, in academia across a range of different dis disciplines. I should be really explicit. It's a great, yes, it, for me, it's very clearly an interdisciplinary PhD because mm -hmm. um, you're pulling together a lot of different threads. I mean, you're identifying different forms of design, interaction design, and kind of practice. Um, but the, the piece that I'm interested in is I want to just go back to is this point you said, you know, that, that, that your frustrations. Because this is like, for me, the frustration is where you're onto something. That's your gold mine, and you're onto stuff, right? And uh, you know, you said the thing that's frustrating is industry isn't hearing it, yeah. right? 
And the thing um, that I wanted to kind of say a little bit about is like, you know, the, the longevity. I think there's kind of a two sides thing because yep. I'm always very reluctant to say, hey, industry doesn't care because it's like, well, I've been talking, I'm sure, you know, lots of people have lost different companies for many years and there's a lot of people who really hear it. Mm -hmm. And I felt like, oh. Uh, so I always want to sort of, I don't see it as a hard and fast thing. I'm sure you don't either. Simply because of here you are, where you are, you're here and you're listening, right? And yep. you're very much collaborative. But I want to maybe say something about w w what this, the longevity of the relationship between uh, the kinds of academic critiques. I mean, we, you know, by, we did Ubicom to death, right? We, we did by, it, yeah. You know, back in the late <laughs> 90s, we did wearable Steve Mann to death. It was critiqued forever. So we've, we know, there's been so much discussion yes. about, you know, the, all the issues you're talking about, the whole notion of the problem with gadgets. You know, I've talked to people across both industry and academic practice about the problems with that for decades. Um, so I feel like you're coming back to something which is very well established as an issue. Yeah. Um, so I was wondering if you can say something about why you feel, you know, you're having to return to something. You know, what's going on there? You know, why do we still feel like, well, some of feel like we're, we're having a similar conversation yes. about, uh, you know, could you say a little bit about coming back to that after yeah. there's been so much that's happened so far in the past? Sure. I think for me that points to the, the gap that I point out, that there's no explicit, this is meaningfulness. This is designing for meaningfulness. And that's because there is so much work, like all the work you mentioned, plus we could go on for another two hours about all the, yeah. like really, right? And I know there's a few people in this room who are tired of that, of that work, right? Um, but I haven't, I haven't seen it really cross over. I think there's, there's institutes like the Institute of Happiness um, that Hassendahl has and the Institute of Positive Design and all these things that are, are out there. But again, I haven't really seen that clearly group, there's sort of like this one paper, or this one other paper, or this one school of thought. And so for me, it was very much about, okay, why if I've been searching for two months trying to do a literature review, finding out, has anyone talked about meaningfulness? I cannot find it, right? Um, if I search for designing for, you know, life fulfillment, a few things start to pop up, but they're sort of more in like philosophy and psychology, and they're a bit harder to read, and I can't really access those. Um, so it was very much about like, okay, there's this huge landscape. How do I sort of find the thing that I'm looking for in, in there? Because right now it's just, it's just this big hole of endless research that's been done and it's, it's amazing research, but how do I bring it up? How do I find the common thread? And for me, the common thread was designing for meaningfulness. Mm -hmm. I like your metaphor. <laughs> Um, something I'm really concerned about these days is like this idea of extractive epistemology. Hmm. You understand what that means? Like, Barely, but go on. <laughs> it's this idea that like making something more transparent or more explicit is not always good. Right. Because you can go to anthropology and you can go to me or you know, yeah. you like expose the tribe to the world and the tribe gets destroyed and yes. it totally shows up in a totally different field uh, or area. But when you talk about meaningfulness in that way, which is that the reason that you're embarking on some of these projects and, and, and the PhD, trying to take something that you that you've looked around and you say, okay, there's nothing out there that's explicit enough. And maybe that's because it shouldn't be explicit. Mm -hmm. so this is a bit of a pretty fundamental question. Sure. Um, and maybe like something I'm wrestling with, so it's not mm -hmm. like I'm repeating it. It's not, a, it's not a challenge to you. It's a challenge to the way that knowledge practices progress in the sense of positivism and mm -hmm. you know, that more knowledge yeah. to keep colonizing as much of the earth as possible. Well. 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 So I'm wondering if you ever had moments when you were thinking about this meaningfulness, you bring up ambiguity a lot in terms, in terms of how meaningfulness operates. Mm -hmm. But I'm curious about your own practices of like, you know, so if you get an excuse, uh, 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 like a mar marketing did in the early 20th century, which was to take psychoanalysis and turn it into reverse, right? So people have new desires because of that. Hmm. That's an a, a opera, operationalization of a very human uh, sort of uh, infallibility or something like that, that then becomes productizable, and so it can be extracted. Mm -hmm. this is, this is I'm curious, during your process of thinking about meaningfulness, did you ever think, like, this is a boundary where I should not go? <laughs> you know, because a product that is that intimate, what yeah. one to the left of you right now, is, 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 is literally productizing. Mm. A relationship that may have other manifestations otherwise, mm -hmm. and maybe putting a technology between two people in that way yeah. allows, I don't know, the topic to be away longer. Mm. And this work cycle. 
<laughs> yeah, and I think that's that's a really good example um, with Feeble there. Um, for me, I was trying to give up. I kept this with me because I can never remember all of them in my head at once anymore. Um, <laughs> but all the different manifestations and um, mechanics, for me, that was a way of diluting this. I could have just focused on one, right, and said like this. But that's sort of where we start to get into that, because if I focus on one and I say just personal development, right? Who is the father? How is he to society? All of a sudden you get into like, you know, a bed of snakes and that's not good, <laughs> right? Um, so for me it was very much about like, could you consider these variety of aspects, right? Just to get your head in the game of thinking about designing for meaningfulness. I think if we say meaningfulness is this, that's, that's a no-go. That's why I called it designing for meaningfulness, right? We're, we're not saying meaningfulness is this explicit thing. And that's why I'm also focusing so often on saying, moving towards future research. I want other researchers to take this, to take these small little nuances and explore them, right? I think if we say we have to explicitly define meaningfulness as a term or as a product desire or as a way of being, it is too explicit. It does get into too many issues of exactly as you explained with people, right? Um, yeah, so for me, it was very much this encompassing and, and again, bringing up all these different characteristics and stuff like that so that we ha can have a better sort of immersed view of these things, right? I don't think that if I had chosen one of the things or if I had put forth a statement saying, this is meaningfulness. <laughs> I mean, first of all, I, I probably would have been very wrong, right? I can't decide what meaningfulness is. And second of all, it would have immediately gotten into those types of situations. So, um, picking up on this uh, meaningfulness, um, and it's something you touch on a little bit in your thesis, you, you have some nice moments of, uh, sort of self-reflection and reflexivity where you're kind of thinking about for whom. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about, you know, the, the kinds of, it, this isn't an audience question, this is about, uh, this is a politics question, sure. so your own politics, which I feel is really nicely present in your thesis, you know, the, 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 the for whom do you want to have effects, you know, for whom do you want these, you know, smart objects to have effects, so I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about, about that sense about how you feel you're located as a designer and, and, and your, your, your work sort of leading to design communities together, um, and that also links to the fact that you sort of said at the beginning, I think you had this nice quote where you was, um, you know, how do we design for meaningfulness in our lives? And I thought that was interesting because how do we design assumes that we're the designers, and meaningfulness in our lives, whose? So, you know, I, it's partly because I felt that reading your work, you were very clearly aware that designing for everybody is a no-go. Correct. Right? And I knew you were absolutely clear about it, was great. So, you're not designing for everybody, mm -hmm. so who? Mm -hmm. um, I think that's, it's such an incredibly broad question slash answer that could come out of this, right? Um, my personal politic, if I should pick up on that, is that I believe everyone is capable of so much more, right? Um, I really find that there are a lot of people, maybe it's in my circles, artists and hackers and that sort of thing, that I meet who are self-reflecting and, and trying to change themselves all the time, and then I meet other people who are not, right? Um, and I think that there's so, not I think, I know that there's so many new things coming up. There's all these apps, there's all this, you know, like, there's all these travel vacations for getaway and, and discover yourself, and all this, this stuff is like popping up more and more and more and more. So somehow our world is turning towards a place where we're trying to explore this, um, self-development, right? So for me, when I say we and us, I mean we, the practitioners, right? Whether in academia or in industry, we the ones who are making things for other people, right? Um, so just to clarify, yes? do you mean we as in the, the, the people you're trying to make a difference to, the, 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 the site of intervention, is the, is practitioners, so it's making a difference back into the practitioners industry in academia? No, there's two parts. Okay. Um, and I'm just going to write that down. <laughs> 
Yeah. Okay, so one part is the we, the practitioners in industry and academia, are making things, right? But there is two parts to the question of who we are making it for. I have kept the lens in my PhD that I am making it for the practitioners, right? I'm making these tools so that they can go out and so everyone in this room can hopefully, you know, take home this and start to think about it. And when they talk to their clients, they can say, hey, have you thought about personal development? Could it not have a screen? Hey, you know. So they, um, the practitioners have some tools or something that they can use. Also, the entire dissertation, like, oh, hey, there's this academic work on this. Can we start thinking about this? Can we pull up that paper? So my PhD is very much for the practitioners. But I hope that the work they do is for everyone, right? The people that they are designing for. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, cool. that's the two parts. Yeah, so that's, I think that's the bit that we'll probably talk a bit more about is about the ways in which the work you're doing here is, is an intervention mm -hmm. into, uh, into, into practitioner worlds. So it's into, yeah. and I think both, and, and the nice thing, and I think the important part of your PhD is the fact that it's both practitioners in industry, practitioners in academia, that, and it, you know, it, it addresses both. But I think for me, that side of the intervention is back here. I think mm. the tech the, there, which is my very poor Danish, as well, uh, you know, that's... Can't do it. <laughs> so, uh, but I think that that is a very important moment where you're demonstrating that. Um, uh, so we'll talk more about that. So do you want to, shall I carry on? Or do you want to <laughs> um, so, um, I think that the, the thing I wanted to go on to talk about was just this, um, the, sort of teasing out this difference between Something about the, the kind of this issue of kind of making intervention here in terms of practitioners, and also something at the end of the thesis where you're saying how do we design things like the you know the existential crisis you talk about kind of you know climate change. Mm. Those, so those seem very different audiences. Yep. Uh, so I was wondering if you could say something about the you know, thinking about where this kind of this the world making aspect of what you're doing. Mm. Anyway, what I'm trying to do. I'll try to make it a little bit more explicit, is connect back to the question Jamie had earlier, which is about if you are making knowledge, you're making you know, you're making information, like FIBO takes a bit of information and puts that in the in the world, and yep. you're right. That's a different thing to say, hey, that's that's the aim I'm trying to do. Whereas I'd like to know if you think that's your aim or whether you think your aim is more about kind of is about a sense of changing your world, whether that's somebody's world or somebody's sense of identity. Those are different things. Making information is one thing. Having a, a, a kind of an intervention which has a particular kind of informed politics or world making is something else. Mm. Could you just talk about those two things and what they are for you in your work? Sure. So I would say that the making information, right? If we take the people example, something yeah. that is uh, making movement on your wrist, and that is the information got from the patch and all this kind of stuff. There's like this data being transferred and there's this information there. That, for me, is the catalyst, right? That is the catalyst which hopefully facilitates the world change, right? And from a practitioner standpoint, we can choose the type of devices that we are making. We can choose the aspects of them. We, we are designing them, right? So we can think about what impact that has, what implication that has for the world change, right? So if we're talking about the world change part, that is, again, that broader audience. I hope that practitioners are able to use this to impact that broader audience and, and impact that world change by you know, beginning to think about these things, by beginning to consider them. And so for me, the, the info, if I understand your word of info correctly, um, those are like the engagements. They're catalysts. They're, they're just demonstrators to show this is one way you could think about this. Right? This is like this one, which we all can't pronounce. Um, <laughs> it was, I, I just presented it at Thai. Uh, last week or the week before, I don't even know anymore. <laughs> and uh, it had such a great response because I had all these people who for me were like superheroes in academia. I was like, ooh, how nice to talk to you. And they came up and they said, oh, it's so refreshing to see something that is offline and not measuring and like the impact that it potentially could have and the way of thinking about this. And for me that was maybe they'll go home and think about that and then they can change the world themselves with their design. It's interesting because it shifts all the things in the room from Mm -hmm. I mean? Yep. Like it's, it, it is the provocation of that. It's a much different framing. Mm -hmm. but yeah, it might be interesting to get that. clear that up a little bit. Because <laughs> if they are being positive, as like market ready, not market ready, but market headed um, products, it's different 
and say, oh, this is a, you know, like a you know, small speculative design intervention. Mm. Of the way of thinking. I think in the, in the dissertation itself, I tried very much to say that these engagements are, are very much just catalysts demonstrating qualities of the manifestations or the mechanics. Um, so they are not, I mean, none of these are products in themselves. The only one with exception of that is FIBO, which is hopefully one day on its way to being a product. Um, TIBA was the other one where we're working with a company wherever that's gone. Um, but that one is the one with the habit changing. Um, but that company has changed their course. So that was more of an exploration in like haptic and touch-based feedback and all this kind of stuff. So again, these are all exemplars of both the physical and the value-based aspects of what I've been discussing. I mean, really what uh, I think well said about the way that like information and meaning are not contiguous spaces, right? There's something about, it. and then it links, yeah, this whole discussion about whether or not more meaning is better and that kind of question, which makes me wonder about maybe I'm channeling the existential Kierkegaard Danish darkness or something. But there is, you know, there's a wonderful um, uh, Virilio quote where he says the invention of the train is also the invention of the train accident. Okay. Right? <laughs> it's true of any technology. Sure. It's true of anything. Nice. Nice. <laughs> you have a knife? <laughs> um, yeah, sure. I mean, we could go you know, the airplane, whatever. It's, mm. it's always a dark matter. That is always present in any space that you open up as a design. And so, one of the things that's really characteristic of, and this is not a critique towards you, I'm probably just, I'm probably just Bring soapboxing, it. <laughs> uh, technology culture. I mean, see, uh, mm -hmm. see uh, um, Kai and T, Kai and Bai and Bai. All the eyes. Are, um, are just spaces of incredible, like, progressivist, capitalistic logic. That more technology, more meaning, more, 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 more. more always be better. Mm. And so I, I also just, I wanted to just presence and maybe get a reaction to the idea that like, I mean a car accident is a very meaningful, you know, it's a lot of meaningful. Um, and even just lower down, sort of less dramatically, like if you have a bicycle that keeps breaking and you repair it little by little, you, that's a meaningful object to you because mm -hmm. you're kind of relational yeah. and our, our relationships with other people are the same. Right? Like mm -hmm. you spend time on friendships and work on them mm -hmm. because they're they're sometimes quite abusive and horrible. <laughs> Again, the dramatic, but you see what I mean? So I'm curious about, like, uh, there's not, because a lot of positive design is based on positive psychology and that kind of Maslow yep. pyramids and all this stuff, which is really a kind of, I mean, I think we could say 20 years on, a slightly bourgeois Western yes. uh, framing of, like, maybe even Scandinavian framing of mm. uh, the way that life should be. Mm. Um, so I'm curious about somehow informing or like cutting through some of these things with, with you know, uh, not really macabre, but dark, dramatic. Sure. Did, did, you, did you ever come across that? Is it something that resonates with you? Um, I think it, it resonates with me a lot. And this is a totally different example, but we're going to jump into it because I think at least a couple of you know what I'm talking about. So I make this event called Grotesque Burlesque. Right? And that was written about a little bit. And then that's very much about taking the ugly, making it beautiful, making a political statement with it. You know, and this is, I think that's very important. I think there's some attempts in critical design to do that. I'm not so familiar with them, but I've seen a couple of interesting projects at least. Mm -hmm. um, Seamlessness might be one of them. Yeah. So, I mean, I think, I think it's very important to, to have those types of things, right, where I don't know if it's the shock value or if it's the, you know, provocation or what it is that makes you start thinking about these things, but I'm just going to jump back to what you were saying before, um, because of course we can have, like you said, like everything is, is building up to more technology and more this and more that and, and everything else, and meaningfulness doesn't need to be about that, of course, you know, we could be the stereotypical monk sitting in Tibet experiencing meaningfulness without any technology around. Mm -hmm. And that's, of course, that sounds lovely, actually. Um, <laughs> at, at this point, <laughs> yeah. right now, it's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, But 
from my perspective, thousands of companies are making new technology every day and coming with their new startups every day. And I've sat on a plethora of startup juries and heard all sorts of ideas. <laughs> and from that perspective, I think it's really important that we start considering this stuff. Or I, I hesitate to say start because, of course, as we talked about originally, we have considered this stuff, right? This is out there. But start you know, bringing it back and saying, okay, yeah, just because in the past decade, like sensors have become ridiculously cheap and it's super fast to get a prototype out and it's, it's so easy to make hardware now. Hardware is still hard, but it's so easy, right? It's compared to 10 years ago, it's very, very simple to throw something together now and be like, hey, wouldn't it be great if my shoes light up when I get tired in my heels and someone can get me a chair, right? Like, yeah, that sounds lovely, but it's not necessary. Right, so I think that's that's very important when we talk about like this increase in technology and all this other stuff. Yeah. I can always say more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I was I was thinking about talking about some of the periphery stuff, yeah, and yeah, the yeah, exactly. So, because um, you know, you mentioned uh, uh, Valesque and Valesque, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and you know, one thing that really struck me that I thought was. I was cheering all the way in your thesis was, um, you know, really, was the fact that you, you know, you put on the table uh, discussions about not just another, but you start off with talking about fibre and the pregnancy, but then you also talked about the uh, sex changing toilets, yep. um, which you kind of did. You mentioned, you know, burlesque, um, and also you, you had um, the, the queer sex toys mm -hmm. and the pleasure objects, and I thought that was incredibly important. Uh, because that is a whole part of uh, design practice. It's very much about identity. You know, it's about issues about gender making. Yeah. And I felt you really you uh, you went there. You 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 know you talked about those issues. I read the, the paper um, really really interestingly about particularly around the, the pleasure sex toys. Uh, but obviously, as someone who I you know, come from a background as a feminist science studies and feminist anthropology, and so I was thinking a lot about queer theory. And I, um, I would have loved to read some queer theory in your thesis mm -hmm. because I kind of, uh, and the reason being is I felt, uh, and I was wondering if you could say a little bit of, about that and, uh, and about what's kind of going on for you with the, because you're talking about identity, which for me is issues about making gender is one of the big ones. Uh, but also, you know, queer theory is about how we don't do binaries. Mm. You know, it's about, okay, there's, not, there's no a priori sex, there's no a priori gender. Mm -hmm. We don't get a priori object and subject. We don't get these given. We have to make them and it's really hard. Yeah. Um, so, uh, and I felt that there's a, there's a politics to doing that. And for me, there's a politics which is enormously, uh, I find it wonderfully generative and hopeful. It's like, well, if these stuff, this stuff isn't there, we don't have to fight them because we've already made them, so let's make them differently, make them differently. So I was wondering in your, if you could say, I've got a number of things to say, but first say a little bit about, you know, what happened in your discussions of, in your thesis, um, why you felt you couldn't say draw upon feminist design or, or queer theory to, you know, discuss your products, or maybe you, you did, it didn't make it to the thesis. Uh, so that, that whole kind of addressing the kind of like, uh, you know, gender making mm. and, the, and the, you know, the, like I said, I think the one thing about the, the pleasure sex object is it's a DIY kit. Mm. You know, it's all for me. I was like, yeah, this is about you make your gender. It's like they're labeled on your box, right? Mm. But I didn't feel you really engaged as much as I would like. So please tell me what your thoughts are about how these thoughts about gender making and queer theory and non binaries, you know, inform your design practice. Because it's not, again, as you know, not about just kind of pleasure or sex toys, it's about everything you're designing. Yes. Um, and I, I think that's. It's something that I've really been thinking a lot about ever since um, working on the Future Pleasure Objects project. Um, but having said that, it's been since I worked on that project. So it's very, very new for me. Okay. Um, we only did that project last May, I think, yes. And um, on that paper, we had several co-authors who do their research in feminist and queer theory. So for me, everything that they wrote, I was like, this is magical. I haven't seen this before. So it's very new. Um, and having said that, I think it's been implicit in a lot of the things that I've been doing, the toilet switching project, the burlesque, you know, all these things, it's, it's been there. And so I've kind of been experiencing it and processing it and, and beginning to understand it, but it sort of came more into focus in that project, right? Because that's when I started to learn, okay, these are these, are these words, and this is what this is about. And when we talk about maybe feminist theory and then this, you know, having values that are different than, 
you know, other regular design research theory and having this humanness that is like exemplified or, or what is sort of emphasized, right? Um, that's been really amazing to learn about, but I am not an expert in it. And that's, it was one, um, for me, that was one case study where we focused on that. And that's why it didn't come more into the rest of the dissertation. It was just this, this one project which is continuing, so I'm super excited to learn more about it, but yeah. Okay, to be continued. To be continued, very much so, <laughs> yes. Um, do you want to give your try? Okay, so I just, so another piece of that was, um, uh, so one of the things that particularly uh, feminist theory um, has, has brought um, has been this discussion about the human and non-human. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's, you know, I was sort of look, again looking for that in your thesis, so this is my opportunity for you to tell sure. me a bit about it, because as some of you may know, in a, in a thesis there's a lot of work that happens that doesn't actually necessarily make it to the text, which is one of the reasons we sit here and we have a chance yeah. to talk to you, yeah. which is really important. Um, so, you know, that, th this whole discussion about if your, you know, identity making and the production of, of the human also being part is a relational thing. Um, and then the, the discussions of, uh, I'm, I'm thinking of people like Donna Haraway, some work I don't know if you've come across, mm. uh, but this, this notion of, if, you know, feedback is because you're sitting next to five hours. I know, getting, this is a terrible decision. <laughs> 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 so, but I think that, you know, it, 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 that, that one makes it really clear is, is, that, is that you've got the ways in which the, the designed object has agency in itself. Um, and so, the, the, you know, if we're talking about a human uh, and non-humans, um, in the in, in FIBO, for example, you've got, a, you know, you've got the, the baby, which is developing its own agency, which you're manifesting, but the, the device itself has agency as a yeah. non-human, and you've got the, 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 the parents, the mother and the father, and they're, they're involved, but also the designer. So I was wondering if you could say a little about the, in your work about the role of, the, of, the, of, of that kind of sets of relations mm -hmm. and the non-humans. So, because I think often in design practice, there's sometimes, not all, because a lot of people do bad stuff, there's sometimes a kind of a, a, a sense in which the object is, a, is, is, is invisible, it's just a, a free conduit for the, what the designer's intentions are. Yeah. So, if you say something about the kinds of, for you, what, the, what, your, what you think the agency and uh, these non humans, these objects you, that you're involved in making are, how they kind of kick back, how they kick back and, sh and make things different for you. Um, as, a, as a designer or potentially for those people who are uh, engaged with them. So that, sure. that would be really helpful. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think that my first reaction to what you're saying is the focus on the value over function. Because for me, the function is, is the object, right? It is the thing, and sometimes people try to hide it away. Sometimes people try to get rid of that technology. Um, but the designer designs the value that you hopefully will get out of using this product, right? So that was something that I tried to focus on um, because I think that that is sometimes lost when we're doing, um, or I've seen it being lost when working with customers because we're so focused on like, oh, does it do the thing it should do? Does it have the right technology in it? And we have to bring our focus back to that value of like, what was the intended experience, right? So there's, for me, that's the more operational side of the agency, right? Like the, the actual function of the thing. Um, and then I think one of the things, the second thing I thought about when you were just asking this question was the role of traditional craft, right? Because that has been something that's been really, really relevant throughout all the works that I've been doing. And for me, that is the thing that ties it together, right? So when we have traditional crafts people working on these things like um, Seknaki, whose name I also can't say, and I just met her and screwed it up as well in person, that was amazing. Um, <laughs> so. She's done a ton of work on all sorts of things, leather and jewelry and I think seaweed and you know just everything. Um, and her work is super, super interesting and she speaks about preciousness, right? And this preciousness of interacting with things that have been made, that have been created and learning about the craft process. And again, I only superficially got into that, both with Feeble, with jewelry designers, with electronic kintsugi, with um, Japanese kintsugi artists. And for me, that's, that's very much a part of it. So if we want to not just have the function, the value in the function, but actually have that translate into something that is not invisible technology, that is not just like, oh, the tech lives over there and we, the people, are over here, then we have to consider traditional craft um, or something similar to it at the very least. Because then we should have that felt experience, right, of like 
how does this make me feel? How do I react to this? How is this you know, impacting my experience and all that sort of thing? Um, and I think that's where the non-human comes in. Because even though there's a human who's making the traditional craft, the end experience is not with that artist who has made the thing or the craftsman who has made the thing. It is with the thing that they have made. And hopefully you can feel the artist in that. And then that's, that's more of connecting the human and non-human. Hybrid object. Yes. The, um, yeah, the, it also brings up the notion of the baby. Mm -hmm. I'm going to move this. <laughs> <laughs> for a certain period of the baby's gestation, one imagines that also the non-human. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> Rather you than me. <laughs> um, and uh, and then the discussion about materiality was making me think about history. Mm -hmm. So like those traditions don't form in the vacuum either. Like for example, I think leather means what it does is a very historically contingent thing mm -hmm. involving fabrication and the whole process involved in colonial history and stuff. And so it makes me think about um, yeah, the limitations and, and, and affordances of the, the sort of technologies that you decided to use. Because you, you for example, as mentioned, you sort of cursorily looked at these sort of elements in some of these designs, which is not the focus of the PhD for sure. But um, when you think about it, there's a, there's a wonderful line where you, where you quote somebody, a parent you interviewed, I'm sorry, we keep going back to the uh, babies don't vibrate. Yep. Right? <laughs> they don't. And this was a kind of critique of like, you know, you're using this particular transducer because it's exist for a particular reason. And one of the things that I was maybe looking for a little bit more in the writing was uh, the, the historical contingency of the tool sets, right? So the reason you have a vibrating motor that's mm. so cheap is because of a particular, you know, no key. Yeah. The whole history of uh, vibration as a kind of transducer. And it's really a great moment, by the way, that I just want to comment, but like, it's an amazing description in there of like, why that is or is not appropriate, and that's the kind of thing that like practitioners should have much more reflection on, so it's a great part of your publication. Okay. Uh, that, that gives us like a you know empirical description of like, look, I tried this, don't do that, it doesn't make sense. <laughs> you know? um, and that's that's really, there's a kind of lack of that in the literature. So that's great. But the part the problem that I that, that it would be nice to elaborate a bit more and, and maybe feel your uh, um, sense of the historical moment in which we exist, both in terms of technological tool sets that are available, right? Like the, this, this, um, this propagation of the, the, the ultimate subject, like, or the, the kind of universal subject, is as problematic as the propagation of the universal object. Mm -hmm. Meaning that these are not, you can't do anything. You can't really do anything. You can do what's available. Yeah. <laughs> and it's available for very particular reasons, particularly when you, see, when you keep calling in the notion that it's getting cheaper and cheaper. So you see what I mean? Like there's something in there about the historical contingency of by vibrating motors and pressure mm -hmm. sensors and these specific things are historically yeah. here at this moment. And whether or not the, the way that you're rhetoricizing meaningfulness as a kind of more universal, you know, meaningful life thing uh, can be actuated just because we happen to have these things. Okay. There's a tension there to me. Yeah. Uh, but like, you know, the human project, which is about presumably living a good life. Mm. Uh, and then sensors that we have lying around that her industry sweeps through and makes it cheaper. Mm -hmm. uh, provokes anything, but it's, mm -hmm. I thought it was, we'd like to do more about it. Sure. I mean, I think my, my initial reaction is just to think about tools, right? Mm -hmm. you've, you've said tool sets, so I think of, we have, we have tools and we make those for a purpose and of course the thing that we are using the tool on that changes our interaction with it, so that's a whole other discussion. <laughs> Um, and then we make machines, and machines are sort of automating what the tools are doing, right? Um, so then for me, it's like this evolutionary point of, of what's next, what is after tools that do a thing and machines that automate that thing, right? Then maybe it's things that are catalysts for changing the way that we think about how we are, right? That's my sort of first impression of that. Like, I think... I think you're absolutely right. The types of sensors and stuff that are available or the most commonly used ones or just an Arduino board, you know, like <laughs> that's, that's what we have available. That's what everyone knows. And so there are certain things that come from that use, but that's a much more technical discussion. I think that's more, I think we can do so much more. Like we can get our hands on, you know, I don't know, a CO2 sensor, right? And we can do something different. 
Um, that's actually where this project originated from, if I should point to this one now. Now I'm doing it. Um, is when I, when I met these students at Kea, I said, your project assignment is to make something using unusual sensors because I don't want to see any buttons. I don't want to see any like LEDs blinking, right? It has to be an unusual sensor and it has to be an unusual output. And that was their design criteria. Um, because I think that it's absolutely possible to use these other types of things. Like for instance, a patch that monitors baby movement and rolling balls that just make you feel like you're feeling the, the kicking, right? Um, but we just have to push practitioners to start thinking about that because there's so much out there that we can use. So maybe that's two sides effect. Okay, so now when we started talking about practitioners, and yes. you said your thesis is meant for practitioners. Mm -hmm. In your ideal future world, if I'm a practitioner wanted to make something, sure. how should they use learning outcomes for your business? You should um, look at, like I was explaining in the presentation, there's several different parts to look at, but I would take it as um, different considerations, right? So if Rasmus, can I borrow your hand up? So in here, for example, Um, in here, I have things like asking some questions, right? So non-screen, what information needs to be communicated? Is a screen the best way to communicate this information? How does it affect someone to look at a screen to get this information? It goes on and on and on. Um, and that's, that's for the mechanics of meaningfulness. And then maybe we could have some for the manifestations. Maybe there could be more than the ones I already presented for the three takeaways. It's to ask yourself a question as a practitioner while you're designing something. Have I considered this? Do I need to consider this? Maybe I don't. Maybe the thing I'm making is an app and then thinking about a non-screen approach doesn't really make sense, right? But maybe the thing that I'm making is a shoe that lights up and then I should start thinking about these things. So for me, these are all provocations is one word, considerations is one word, catalyst is another word. They're ways to think about your design, if that makes sense. I want to recommend the practitioner to make workshops like you did, starting from there with sketches, asking now that next step of target audience with close to final users. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah. I definitely For recommend. For personal meaning making. Yes, and I mean, they, they should definitely do that because that is a good design process to do these workshops and, and gather the knowledge from the participants and build your designs around that. I mean, that is definitely what I follow in terms of uh, design research. But I think that giving them some questions, just like we have, we have lots and lots and lots and lots of frameworks out there. We have lots of guidelines. We have lots of um, endless decks of cards, <laughs> endless decks of design cards out there. <laughs> um, and I really tried hard not to make any of those. <laughs> um, but these are tools to help us as practitioners to think about things that we might not remember to consider. Because, I mean, remembering all this stuff in your head all the time every time you do a workshop when you're trying to make sure that people have water when they need it is tough. Could I um, follow up on your question? It's okay, sure. Um, this is one thing I've been looking forward to talking about, so I'm just going to do this because I felt it was a nice segue. Do it. And uh, also it's possibly hopefully a little bit fun, um, which is basically <laughs> asking questions about the form of your thesis. Yes. As I like this, right? It's a... Uh, do that as well. It's an object, right? It has weight, yeah. it has mass, it has a certain style of writing. You did work to kind of like the design of the thesis, it has a particular style of writing. Mm -hmm. There was a whole set of uh, des design decisions yes. and, and also writing decisions, and the same with, with this. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> if anyone else would like to throw something on the floor, now is the time. I didn't do that on Is for a simple question, uh, is like you're, you know, you're, you're a design practitioner, yes, uh, sure. and you've designed all these objects to make an intervention, yep. right? You, you know, and this is this is why I come, you know, I think you of the reading of what you're doing with these objects. So, when you're thinking about what you're trying to do, which I kind of in a way I found meaningfulness for me was less helpful than, than the uh, eudaimonia. And mm. the principle of making, you know, it's a making a difference to self yep. principle, um, which I found very, very helpful. And certainly, we'll hear a bit more about that. But what is it for you that you made this object of the thesis this way mm -hmm. in order to have that eudaimonic, 
Well, I've said that right, we'll go with it, right? But that, that effect on the people who are reading your thesis who are the people who are trying to make difference to. Okay. Are we talking about the format or like the actual contents or the whole thing or no, all, yeah. of it? all of it? All of it. Well, basically, it's, it's, you know, <laughs> we'll get to the diagrams. We'll get to the diagrams. But uh, yeah. it's, it's, there's a lot of, so, you know, that's, it's a really important thing because this has, no, you know, carrying that as a weight has an effect. It does. Right. All those questions, so was, could you say a little bit about how you, the structure of the thesis and the shape of the thesis as an object and the way you believe this is going to have the effects that you want? Yep. Um, I tried, so uh, maybe for all the people who have not yet read the thesis, <laughs> we haven't gotten into the 238 pages, great. Um, I tried very much to make it accessible to a wide range of people. I wrote it in hopes of both industry and academia reading it because I read a lot of PhDs in getting ready to write this one and I did not understand them. <laughs> um, it took a lot to really wrap my head around the way that they were phrasing things and everything else. So language was a choice, making it accessible to a wider audience who does not have time to look up words like eudaimonia or whatever else in every second word. Um, the second thing was the, the actual like way that I set up the chapters and maybe I can just... I think it would just go back to the first slide, that would just be a lot easier, right? But, no. Yeah, someone sing. We're almost there. Because <laughs> it's going to make so much sense when the diagram is here, I promise. There we go. Okay. So, um, the way that I did this, just for everybody, is we started with the vignette that I printed, showed in the um, presentation as well and introduce the methodology and then introduce the dissertation, did a chapter about creative drifting and theoretical drifting and it kind of works inwards, right? Um, and this was very much because I wanted to, first of all, set the tone with the vignetta because I think it's, you know, when we say designing for meaningfulness, 10,000 questions come up, right? Um, and I found that when I was speaking to people, if I just introduced this small story first, then they were kind of on board with me. Then we're like on the same page from page five. <laughs> Um, and then the methodological approach, I wanted to handle that as a very academic chapter. This is, this is the methodology. If you are a research practitioner in academia, you know what I've done, right? Like this is the way that I've done this. And then I wanted to introduce the dissertation and that's sort of like, I wanted it to be clear enough that my parents could read it, right? I wanted them to know what it is that I'm doing and why you should continue reading, right? Um, then I have the theoretical and creative drifting section and that was a balance. Right, that was like, here's some past product projects which inform my optics, and here's some theoretical you know, literature that informs my optics. And thus, you know, I can start to go forward. <coughs> um, I presented the engagements as a gallery, and I was trying, I don't remember who talked about that, someone with a K, it's on the tip of my tongue. Um, to try and, very much like we see here, like get an idea of all of these and, and what their qualities and values and everything were and then presenting the research companies as its own chapter so that we can say, okay, now let's put our heads in industry and figure out what's happening here. Um, and then bringing this all together through the annotated portfolios to sort of like bring it all in one place so we can look at it all at once. So that's format, the sort of, that's one word for format, the organizational structure. Um, and then there's the actual graphic design of it. Um, and the graphic design was again chosen to engage people. I had seen so many PhDs where I got to page 20 and I was like, there's so much text here, I cannot. <laughs> um, and I just felt like if we took a book approach to it, where it was a very readable font, where it was like engaging, I, I worked with um, another student at Albury University to make the diagrams and she guided me through an incredible process which made me rethink a lot of things. And she said things like, okay, well, if you know we're looking at these little Hieroglyphics, as someone said earlier. <laughs> um, you know, is personal development, is it iterative? Should it, should it be like this, right? Um, and, you know, critical thinking, it has some hard angles because when you hit, you know, a point of critical thinking and you realize something and you go in a different direction. So there was a lot of discussion about this sort of thing. And also about the three different um, bubbles representing people to people, people to self, and people to time. Um, and then we also have 
some large images for each of the engagements. And that was, again, to show people what these things are, because it's one thing to describe, OK, we made a bracelet, and inside of it are three balls, and they push on your skin. And it's quite another thing to actually see an image of these things and begin to understand what it is. So I don't know if that answers your question, it's but that's. Partly, uh, yeah, I guess it's partly, um, I know you've got some specific questions. Do you want to do the question of I'll just. I'm just OK, yeah, keep an eye on time. Because okay. as you can tell, we're quite excited by, by the, the many things to talk about in the thesis. I wanted to uh, just push it a little bit and ask, because I felt that, in a way, there's a sort of a, um, it's a very challenging thing to try and make this thesis do many things for many different people. Mm -hmm. So you've got, uh, you're trying to make it, it has to satisfy the requirements of a PhD in order to be a PhD document, but you also enable it to be read by a large number of people, which is absolutely to be lauded, for sure. So my question to you is still back to the, you know, thinking about what it is that you're trying to do as make an intervention. You're trying to make uh, a difference and uh, an intervention. You're trying to change how people, uh, well, as, as I read your thesis, about thinking through, you know, how to change people, their sense of identity, who they are, how to, you know, you create, it, it's about meaning of the, of, of the self. That's very profound, and it's um, what I would call ontological, but, uh, you know, it's about world making, it's about making a, a difference in the world. Um, and that's why I think, but in order to do that, my question to you is, is actually a written book form thesis the way to have done that, mm. maybe? Again, not as a criticism, because that's why I said, let's just kind of like, there's things you have to do, yep. but I'm saying, if you could have done anything. Yes, right? that's a great question. All right, you could have done absolutely, and I, no, for me, I mean, we were up for it. Like, if you said, right, I want you to go to stand in a dark room, and seriously, mm. and the same way that, you know, what you did with the trade fair, you know, I felt that, but I want to live with that object, mm. because that affects on a person is what I feel you're trying to do in yep. your thesis. So tell me, if you could have done anything <laughs> to basically, you know, what would it look like maybe? Yep. You know, just. I, I love that question, first of all, thank you. Um, and second of all, we actually talked about that, Mike and I. <laughs> um, so Mike is running the Art and Tech Incubator up in Elsinghorn called mm -hmm. Catch. And we talked about, couldn't it be great to make an exhibition hall? And you come in and you experience each of these engagements and you, you try them out and, and then we have a chat about it afterwards, mm -hmm. right? That is one way that we actually did talk in depth about it because I would love for people to really try, maybe even like, like I wanna say cold trying, like cold calling, like I don't tell you anything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then you go try all the engagements and then we come back and we have a discussion about, okay, what were the qualities of this? I'm not gonna tell you any of the ones that I think, let's have a talk about this, mm -hmm. right? And in a room full of both design researchers and artists and hackers and industry, I, I would love that. That would be brilliant, right? Because that, for me, is very much what it's about. It's about experiencing these things. And I tried to convey the experience as best I could write it, because the format is a written kappa around the publications. Um, so that would be one way that I would love to do that. I mean, that would be great. Yeah. Should do it. <laughs> yeah, we, we were a tiny bit restricted by like protocol and formalities and, and stuff. And, yeah. <laughs> Did you, one final question and I'm going to hand it over because there's going to be quite a few of these because this mm. feels like a rich vein of, of work. <laughs> um, did you have any thoughts about, and I'm, I'm, I'm a writer and a poet as you, as you know, as did one you know? way of, of thinking through writing practice. So did you, um, and the reason I'm asking about words is obviously this is a written document. Mm -hmm. So uh, was there any discussion about the kinds of language you were using? Because mm -hmm. um, most of a lot of this written in quite an objective narrator voice, mm -hmm. using a form of objectivity. And I felt there were moments where I, I wasn't sure if that was the way to kind of like convey what you were uh, actually trying to get across. So you could say something about some of the tensions maybe you felt and the sure. decisions. Yeah, very helpful. I think that's a really nice question as well because I, I had a lot of tensions, as you can see, from the gutter of rejection. Um, I have had many, many rejected papers, um, far more than I have written. And that is because I had a huge challenge in writing because I am not used to academic writing. I am used to business writing and they are different worlds entirely. Um, so when I sat down to write this, actually long before I sat down to write this, when I started this PhD after the first three rejections um, and I realized I need to figure this out, then I started a blog. And the blog is a long format blog that I've been publishing on Medium and LinkedIn. And that was a way for me to get all these thoughts out in the way that I wanted to write. Just blah, 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 right? Very structured, hopefully readable for everyone, but still, just me, right? 
Um, so when I sat down to write this, I was very conscious of the fact that I have all these rejections, and they're often commenting on my lack of, like, oh, why didn't you explain this using this word? And I said, because why, right? Like, I can explain it using that word, and it's the same meaning. And, you know, so when I sat down to write this, I had all of that in my head, plus all the publications that I had done where I had figured out how to speak that language, right? Um, not fluently, but enough to get by. <laughs> um, and when I sat down to write this, I was very aware of that. I was very aware that when I write this, I need to communicate clearly to this large audience, this broad audience that we've talked about. But I'm, it needs to be academic, and it needs to say the thing that I'm trying to say, and it needs to convey this extremely difficult topic where we're talking about emotions and humanness and all this kind of stuff, but still using words that are objective, right? So it's been a challenge. <laughs> so one final comment on that, Bill Henry, would just say that it seems to me there might be, it's about also the, the venues of publication. So I don't publish in ACM journals because mm. my language would never be accepted by an ACM journal because I'm writing in a different field. Right? Yeah. So I'm just thinking that may be something to explore. If you're thinking about reaching different audiences yeah. in future, you might want to think about the sites of publication. Yeah. And because I know there's lots of journals and sites that basically would really like that much more uh, sort of like first person writing that you say, you know, doing on medium. There would be academic sites that are very legitimate, which I think would be very interested in what you're doing. Let's um, please so talk about those because yes, I would love to hear so about them. I just them. want to say that, that you know, yeah. that it's, it's, I, I think the audience you're writing with is absolutely the right one because you're trying to reach you know, interaction. Mm. But I want to say there's also other audiences that we can talk about after the That would be the great. Events. Yeah, thank you. I think you would enjoy uh, listening to Stephen Pinker's scientific writing for the 21st century okay. because you are very much in line with what he's saying. All right. I will, I will write that down, but I might have to ask you for it later on. <laughs> thank you. Uh, so, I mean, I'm, uh, I'm just probably going to compliment you. Oh, that's so, okay. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> because I think the thing that we're swimming around is this notion of audience, social identity, and stuff. And what you've done very, very well is presence a whole bunch of communities that you care for and are custodian for and voice for, mm -hmm. and trying to translate them into another one. So, I want us to be just the father. Thank you. Um, and I also think that maybe, just to follow up on or just bring up like that could be more present. Mm -hmm. I think that there's something about the, the creation of that false audience sometimes that happens in particularly academic practices where you think, well, these people want to hear it in this way, and but then that means that nothing ever changes, yeah. right? Because you continually give them what they want, yeah. but they don't exist. <laughs> and so there's something about, I mean, ACM is a good example. Like that's a that's a, a, a kind of bee's nest of mm -hmm. you know. Uh, Independent self referencing and language that always kind of circumvents itself. And, you know, so. Yeah. and so, yeah, other audiences are super great. Like, you know, there are new branches of these kind of channels that are just like, look, uh, like we were talking about meaning before, I am a method, which is what I really wanted to hear you write about. Like, uh. this is my life. Uh. You know, and it's very touching, actually, like how many people you've collaborated with, and how many contexts you've worked in, and how many ways in which you've obviously been very generous. And, I feel somehow like, like, like let me free fly, fly. You know? <laughs> like, just let that come out because huh. it's like a beautiful chronology. Because if people probably know that the projects in this PhD span much longer than the PhD, right? Yeah. You, you, that's 10 years of your life. And it's your life. Huh. I think you can talk about that. Yeah. So there's kind of, there's a bit of, I think we were both a little frustrated that there's a little bit of retroactive justification. We're just like, this is awesome. <laughs> just like talk about awesome shit. Thank you. <laughs> so your compliment couched in a slight writing <laughs> recommendation. And, yeah. And also just like, you know, now you're at this position and this place in life. I want to know what you're going to do next. Mm. Uh, that is a very good question. Uh, one of my main things is I feel like I've just started scratching the surface in terms of how to approach at least industry because I, I am here. Um, in my role, and I have access to a lot of companies. And because I have that access, first of all, that's something that a lot of researchers I've talked to have been super excited about. They're like, oh, wow, you, you talk to companies, that's great. Can we talk to companies too? So I value my position here in being able to um, access those companies and hopefully work with them more on this subject. 
And I actually, I just had a beautiful email exchange with um, Dr. Eliza Meckler because she just won this Best Paper Award for her work on meaningfulness. And I just said, you know, we, we were chatting back and forth talking about like, could she be the superstar of academia in terms of meaningfulness? And I can be the superstar of meaningfulness in industry and then we can work together and we can collaborate and we can bring those two worlds together. So that's something that I hope we can do. Thank you. <laughs> um, I, uh, I just, I don't know if you want to talk to me about that. I don't know if you want to go back to the diagrams now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was, I was trying to go specific, only kind of list yeah. of specific questions. How like are we going to Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm trying to think of a decent segue. I'm going to, I'm going to give up with another being elegant. Have we got, how much time have we got? Half now. Half now, okay. Um, so we can pick up a few kind of little things. Sure. And these, this will feel a bit of a clunky because uh, from the kind of, but it, we'll go with yeah. it. So, um, and, and I want to pick up on this uh, notion of care because, I mean, you just talked about it. Mm -hmm. Not possible so much. Yeah. Um, well, uh, good attempt. <laughs> so, uh, because I think that that was, you know, as, as Jamie said, you know, it's so present in the work. Um, and it's really important, but uh, one thing that uh, I want to, is a way for me to sort of suggest it could be, you know, not so in, in, in any kind of right rewrite, but a way to think about is um, care as a method. It's been talked about as a method, certainly in, in the fields that I work in, in, in science studies and in anthropology. And it's very, very, it's an important method. It's not, it's not in a fluffy kind of, hey, we care, but it's, it's about the things that you talked about explicitly, uh, and those like things like time. So one of the things that I thought was really valuable is, again, I'm thinking of avenues for you to develop, and I thought yeah. that um, there was more that you, you could do around this issue around time linked to care, because care takes time. Mm. Um, and you talked about, you briefly passed through ideas of slow design, linking to you know, slow science and slow food. Um, you know, the, the trek there, which mm. just feels to me, again, that manifestation of, of, of a time, of creating time. Mm. Um, and you know the kinds of change, you know, the kind of things that you are affecting is also something that is takes time. Yes. So making time is a is a gift of care. Mm. Um, so I was wondering if you could say something a little bit about this. In a way, what's like, you know what 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 is this relationship between time and care in your thesis? So I was a little bit worried that you got a little bit kind of what I would call positivist, like time's a thing we count. And you know, cause normally, <laughs> normally, particularly you know, working yep. in, you know, in, 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 in well, frankly, in academia and industry in this day and age, you know, time is money, right? Yep. You've got three years you do a PhD, but that's all you, you know. Yep. I um, so these, but I felt that you were absolutely, you were pushing against that. Mm. But then there's moments in your thesis where you kind of do metrics or people and time and slow, and fast, but it's a little bit less sophisticated than what I actually felt mm. was in your thesis. So could you say something about this time and care and? slow design, there's something in there if you could elaborate on it, I think it's important. I can try to elaborate on it. Um, for me, um, one of the, and just to go back, this, this is the segue, to go back yeah, to, yeah, yeah. <laughs> to Jamie's thing, um, I had this chapter, chapter four, about my history and my mm -hmm. past projects, and that was a challenge to include that, because I was like, am I allowed to write, you know, about my personal life and what I've done and stuff like that, but then I did, and Apparently it was okay. Um, and so for me, that, that aspect of time, that's the first aspect of time that I'll address, that it was very important for me to consider the whole, and I call it drifting, the whole creative drifting, right? Because that has formed my way of, like, why I think the way that I do. So time has been a very important aspect throughout the entire thing. Um, I think, I thought a lot about how much I wanted to talk about time. I wanted to bring it in as one of the three takeaways. Um, I wanted to explore it in each of the engagements, like is this a time-based thing, is it not, how is it, et cetera, et cetera. I think there could and should be an entire PhD about time. Um, just time about, what? yeah, exactly, about. So you don't want to do a repeat party of justice. No. <laughs> Good Lord. Um, <laughs> I think for me, like, when I, when I talked about time in the three takeaways, then there was these three different parts of it, right? And one was the representation of time. Um, because the first two are kind of almost obvious. You can do that. You can do short versus long. You can do um, a sense of time. I think there's a lot of products that are, that are out there that are attempting to do that. But this representation of time, this 
considering who I've been and who I want to be and who I am and like how do I represent the time that I'm in and the time that I'm becoming and all these types of things, this representation of time, that's for me, that was one of the, the parts where I was like, ah, oh, if I had more time, I would get into this representation of time. Um, in terms of, yeah, time and care, I think it's very much, yeah, to be able to approach these things, to be able to like look at these different things, all of this takes, you know, reflection, and that's why I refer so many times in the in the thesis to reflection and action, right? Because it's very much I think the care part is also in the action, right? It's like you can let's say we're having a conversation between friends, and I'm like you're telling me about your breakup, and I'm like oh that's awful, and we're reflecting about everything, but unless you do some action, we can reflect, and that's great, and we heal and everything else, but at some point there must be action, right? Sometime we must start to get over this, we must start to figure out who we're becoming after this, we must start to go on, right? And for me that, that is very much an aspect of the care, is a reflection plus action, right? And I think that's also very much part of the time because when does that action come? It can't always come immediately, sometimes it has to come later, sometimes we have to be in a long period of like figuring out what the action is, and sometimes it's a very short period of figuring out what the action is. If my Fitbit says I've done 8,000 steps and I need to do 2,000 more to hit 10,000. Why is reflection no action? It is, in some ways, and it's not in some ways. Um, in some ways it is because just like a hammer changes, you know, how we use a tool, like a tool changes the activity that's affecting, I think reflection also changes as you're doing it, right? It changes your way of thinking about it, you're redefining things and everything else. So in that way, it is an action. Mm -hmm. But I've seen a lot of, and I honestly can't name one of them right now, but I've seen a lot of works where it's like, okay, I've made this thing and it allows you to sit for five minutes a day and, and consider stuff. And that's very good for the person, but it doesn't necessarily lead to an action. They might sit for five minutes a day for 500 days, and that doesn't mean that they're necessarily going to have the tools or the intrinsic motivation to do something. Right, um, and maybe that gives them something good. You know, sitting for five minutes a day might be incredibly useful for you. Um, but let's say you have a higher goal or something else. How do you how do you make that step from the one to the other? That's where I talk about the action. If that makes sense. Okay. okay. Go for it. The best designer that I know uh, is a hero of mine, Ian Curry. Okay. Well known. He used to have this line that he always said, which is like, you should always design for the dimension above the one you're thinking about. You know, kind of just whatever that means. Yeah. And so I was thinking as you were discussing this kind of action release and, and actually even some of your references to like, I don't know, somebody meditating on the mountain, these kinds of things, like there's this implied sense that these products and ideas and meaningfulness, it, it, re it relates to an earlier question I asked about like what you think you're reacting to academically. Mm -hmm. It's like I would. I'm. I'm. I'm actually concerned. It's not maybe even a question. Sorry, I keep doing this, but it's <laughs> like there's there's a concern to me that like a lot of the things that are being addressed by meaningfulness, both in practice and in so like you have the fire sculpture, for example, which or the fire mm. cannon. Right? Yep. I forget what it's called. Uh, where you're trying to bring people together, mm. and so implied in that is that people are not together. Mm. Uh, the people thing, you know, there's a distance between the parents. And so they, Everybody has to go to work, that kind of stuff. And so I, I'm just, I'm interested in like, do you feel the culture, in terms of its ability to act, also like this sort of fire question, um, is in trouble, or like, it is, you know, like there's an anxiety economy. Mm -hmm. like, people talk about baking, like anxiety baking. Yeah. When people just used to bake. And this right. Is a strange sort of world. That would explain so, all the baking shows. Yeah. <laughs> okay. uh, or you know, that was the the lady who cleans everything up in your house. Yeah. You know what I'm talking about? All these kind of these like they're like therapeutic practices mm. that meaningfulness seems like it's fundamentally responding to something. Mm. And so I, I'm just curious if you have a sense of like is that does that do you feel that also or is yeah. that just me? Yeah. And if, if so, like yeah, is that part of your overall? Yes. Arching? I think I, I spoke about that a little bit earlier with um, mm -hmm. Laura's question. Um, I would just say one 
thing in response to, for instance, explosion village or, or FIBO or whatever it is, mm -hmm. it's not that people are not gathering. We're trying to, you know, create, it's about the design, um, oh, what am I trying to say? Like intention, oh, okay. right? It's about the design intention. So we're, we're creating a place for people to gather, to be playful, to, you know, be primal, to do something different, um, to create a memorable experience, right? Like in the old days of Geek Physical, my company, our motto was, we want to make people go home saying, you wouldn't believe what I did today, mm -hmm. right? So I think the design intention is, is very different in all of those. I'm not saying that people don't gather or that people don't connect mm -hmm. over a pregnancy or whatever else. Um, having said that, the simple answer is yes, I think there's a problem. <laughs> um, I could elaborate on that for quite a long time, but I do think that, and I, I don't think I'm alone, there's many, many articles and there's constant things about like, oh, we're, are we addicted to our screens? Are we too much into a digital age? You know, all this kind of stuff. Um, and I think it's, it's very, very important right now to consider the humanness in the technology, right? I think it's incredibly difficult to design technology without thinking about the greater impact and both on the individual and on society and on people connecting together and all sorts of stuff. And I'm seeing so many examples of these gadgets, like the examples I gave, but there's just so many examples of them. And I was actually, when, when preparing these different presentations, I've seen many, many justifications, I guess is the right word. So there was one for the smart hairbrush um, where they said, oh, but what if it could detect that you had a tumor in your head because as you brush your hair, it can see that your skull is changing. And I'm like, okay, great. If that one in a million case happens, this technology is super interesting and I'm all for it. If it's telling you if your hair is breaking, meh. you know, it's convenient, but it's not, you know, um, or maybe it is convenient that it tells you if you have a tumor. Maybe that's not, you know, but it's just the, the number of these smart things that are coming out, um, which feed into this whole digital age that we're living in and this whole aspect of, okay, we're just creating more and more and more and more tech and we're spending all of our time and our phones and all this kind of stuff. It's not necessarily bad. There's many good aspects to it. But I'm just asking if we can also look at the aspect of meaningfulness. If the hairbrush detected tumors, it would give me anxiety. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I would never use that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. <Yeah. laughs> I think, you know, um, I mean, we're, we're partly, I think we're reaching the end, and, 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 and it's just, there's one thing I kind of uh, wanted to kind of get a, a sort of slight reminder of, and also you talk about the humanness. Yes. And the hairbrush for me, you know, your example about that is like, you know, that is so middle class problems, right? Yes. And I think you're very, and I, but I think you're very conscious of that. Because um, I, would, I would kind of like urge you to also be cautious of that we. Which is so easy to to, to use. That That's we a very use, good point. This. Yeah. And and I know you're reflexive about that because you have moments of being reflexive about that in your thesis. Mm. Um, but I, I kind of like would urge you because you know sitting here you know this this is a bit of white middle class Denmark. It is right. And, mm. and and that's important to remember. I mean you know uh, I collaborated with you on a project in Hasthol. Yeah. You know still in Denmark. It's a very different place. Very different. Uh, yeah. And that's what you know. And um, so you know being really cautious about that we. And, um, and and thinking about and like because I feel that that lack that taking a breath before you do things because it seems to me in the you know the example of the hairbrush which is you know it's an easy target but you, it know, is. <laughs> you know it's the classic you know the, the kind of a smart toothbrush that everyone thought would make a full thing from joke until it wasn't um, but I think that that, that sense in which uh, the, the humanness but I also worry about the word humanness mm -hmm. because it makes a we yes that I sense that your project is actually trying to push against like and be more kind of situated and be more careful against. Yeah. So I was wondering if you could say two two things. One is about again, and maybe we're sort of coming to about, you know, this this humanness, what does it mean if when we talk about humanness we're not talking about all humans, but a particular group of humans and for whom do we want to talk about? And the second part of the question, and this is going to be possibly unfair, but we're gonna do it again sure. it's be fun, is you know when I'm thinking about humanness for me in technology, it's like you can't not it, not because you, because of the materials, because you know, you know, we know about where coal tank comes from and the politics and the problems with, you know, coming from the Congo. We know about all the stuff in manufacturing, um, and you know, the problems with cheap unpaid labour. We know about reuse. We know about marine plastics, mm. right? This is stuff we're conscious of, 
kind of you know designing as as, as you are very aware of. I know very much on the front line of that. So the notion that we can do everything we want. No. I mean, just end up because of the fact it's not. We no longer live in a world of any where, where we cannot be aware of those limitations. So as long as you can say something about that humanness that's always intrinsic to design, because the materials yep. have to come from somewhere, and that, and again, that, that who that human might be for you in this project, given it's not everybody in here, but there are some particular people in conversation. With. Yeah. Well, that's a loaded question. <laughs> um, I think the first thing that I'm I'm thinking about with that is. I, I almost want to argue that we, again, don't know about all those things. I've done a lot of presentations at the Engineering Society with 400 people who are all working in technology in front of me, and I talk about something like where our electronics are sourced from, and there is shock on their faces. They have no idea, right? Um, and it's unfortunate, but it's true. A lot of people that I talk to don't know about any of that stuff, about the manufacturing or anything else. So I think that that aspect of the humanness really needs to be uncovered. And I hinted at a few times in my dissertation, like, hey, guys, let's think about obsolescence. Let's think about why we're making things. Let's look at design for the anthropocene scene and all that sort of thing. Um, but as that was not the point of my thesis, I was not trying desperately not to go into it further, but it is such an important, important aspect. I think when we talk about humanness, it's very much one of the things I tend to think about a lot is here in force technology. This was part of a three-year performance contract. We write applications saying we would like to explore smart products and how to design for them using design thinking methods. We send that off to the ministry. They award us with a big bunch of money, and then we're able to explore those areas, right? If I put designing for meaningfulness in the next application, that means that it's on a political agenda, right? That means that we're going to think about these things in industry, that the politicians are gonna think about these things, that they're gonna say, hey, it's really important that we start thinking about this stuff. And that's where I think the humanness comes in because yes, it's, I mean, especially coming from Vancouver, a very, very multicultural place, we are in a very, very white room right now. <laughs> um, and that is super apparent to me, I don't know, you know, like it's apparent to you as well, I think it's, yeah. So I don't, I cannot design this for everyone but I can design it for the people that I am interacting with in the communities that I'm interacting with, and I can tell them, and hopefully politicians, hey guys, we have to do something, right? But I think that we need to consider that humanness in all aspects of it, if that helps. Yeah. yeah. Can I quote you? This interview is interesting as it showed a distinction between a meaningful object, designing for a meaningful experience, and designing Mm -hmm. and so, as a way of giving you a, <laughs> which seems to be the end, here, um, can you can you tell me the difference between designing a meaningful object and designing? Yes, I think so. Um, I bring it back to the toilet. <laughs> we can design a meaningful object that is a toilet. We can design a meaningful object that is, for instance, um, Moles Ale, they made all these like reflective tools and I just, I'm in love with their work. They made such beautiful tools for reflection, right? Those could be meaningful objects, but again, I, I think the, the problem is in the statement meaningful object, which just becomes more and more and more and more apparent every time I say the word meaningful. Um, we cannot make meaningful objects, we can only make a design intention of a meaningful experience, right? We can only design for, people to take their own meaning away from it. So I think this whole thing about designing for meaningfulness needs to be very, very carefully worded, that we are designing for meaningfulness, for people to go in and have their own experience and decide whether or not that's meaningful for them. I don't know if that answers your question, but that. Yeah. Mm, absolutely. I think we're done, so yes. Thank you. I think I've talked to all of you about asking questions. <laughs> there will be punishments. I guess 
one for sure, right? Yeah, I have I have one question. Um, <coughs> you didn't talk to me, Vanessa. Um, <laughs> um, I come from a company that tries to squeeze in chips in all around us, and there's a desperate need for what you're working on, Vanessa. And it's it's a great presentation, and we need way more meaningfulness. There's so many smart, unnecessary products out there. So, in order to make that change happen, now you've guided us on how uh, we design the products to include more meaningfulness, but how do we sell the meaningfulness? What's your thoughts about how do we sell the meaningfulness of mm. these products? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I actually, I had a really good conversation with Wow, I'm lacking his name. The guy who worked in ePatch for so long. Um, and he's worked in industry for 30 years, um, off also here at Delta. And then he, we asked him, do you think we could sell this? Because he was one of the workshop participants. And he said, it is going to be such a hard sell. right? He said, how are you going to sell consultancy to companies, teaching them about designing for meaningfulness and getting them to practice it? He said, but it's needed, and as soon as you do this presentation or have that meeting with them, you know, once you get your foot in the door, they're going to know why it's needed, right? So I'm hoping that that is the case. I mean, I think it's, it's like a lot of the other things we sell in a demo lab. It's fluffy until you sit down and hear about it, and then it's concrete, and then you're like, okay, this is what I need, right? So I think there's going to be a, a bit of convincing going on. <laughs> um, but I hope that once I hear why, that's, that's going to sell it. I don't know if that answers your question. Okay. And then the product that, that then comes out, mm -hmm. how do you then sell this at, as a meaningful product and not just a yeah. connected product? Uh, I would urge you not to sell it as a meaningful product. Uh -huh. I would urge you to sell it as one of the nuances, right? This product will help you with personal development. This product will help you with um, gaining value in your life. This product will help you do some critical thinking, right? And I emphasize will help you and not that it will do it for you, right? So if we say a meaningful product, as I was answering the last question, I'm not selling meaningful products. I'm not making meaningful products because who am I to dictate what is meaningful to you, right? Thank you. Okay, so if there are no other questions for, from the audience, I guess we can give a hand to Vanessa. Hi everyone, Hello. thank you again for being an audience to this historic occasion. That's the um, we, have a, we have to do the, we, we would like to, we don't have to, uh, do a prepared statement, I guess? Yes. Um, which, which sort of culminates this event in some way. Vanessa's work demonstrates the synthesis of many of her communities of practice and knowledge. This ranges across amalgamation of methods from design research, artistic research, self-reflection, technology development, design practice, and media technological artistic practice. Her thesis is an interdisciplinary achievement and innovative in its academic positioning, drawing together collaborative and cooperative activities, as well as multiple stakeholders in industry, academia, community, and social technology development. Vanessa's community stewardship and care for her work, and these communities are expressed through all the projects presented, and this is to be applauded as both a mode of personalized relational scholarship and an intervention into knowledge practices in both in industry and academia. Uh, Vanessa, uh, in the presentation, effectively located a thesis across industry, academia, and communities of practice, as well as spanning interaction design through to human-computer interaction design research. 
Over two hours, the question and answer session topics ranged over the thesis structure, the contextual basis, the social political positioning, and opportunities for further development and dissemination to diverse audiences and publics. There was one um, overall, Vanessa gave rich, enlightening, adept, clear and precise answers to all the questions and generated a lively and wide-ranging discussion marked by its honesty and its insight. On this basis, the assessment committee recommends that the PhD degree is conferred on Vanessa Julia everybody has been a part of this is the biggest part because I've had so many late night discussions over wine and not over wine and on long walks with pretty much everybody in this room as well as many other people about this subject because it does tend to spark conversation <laughs> and uh, so I just want to say thank you to every one of you and to also all the communities because that's been really really amazing and I hope we can go out and design for meaningfulness. I will keep it short and sweet. There are drinks and things. <laughs> but I hope you guys can all use this in your practice. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you.